Welcome everyone to the Cultivating Compassion Education Series, sponsored by Compassionate Care ALS. We are fortunate today to have Dr. Suma Babu here to speak with us uh, from the Healy ALS Clinic at Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Babu is an assistant professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School and provides clinical care for people with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and other motor neuron diseases at the multidisciplinary ALS clinic at MGH. Dr. Babu completed her neurology training at the Cleveland Clinic, Ohio, and two fellowships in neuromuscular medical and neurodegenerative disorders at Harvard Medical School. Her clinical research training includes the completion of the following, a two-year competitive clinical and translational research academy program at Harvard Medical School, a master's in public health at the University of Maryland School of Public Health, and a competitive NIH-funded clinical trial methodology course. Dr. Babu co-chairs the NEALS Consortium Imaging Subcommittee an international organization for ALS researchers. Her research is funded by prestigious awards from NIH, NINDS, the American Academy of Neurology, the ALS Association, and the Muscular Dystrophy Association. It's my pleasure now to introduce our founder, Ron Hoffman, who's on the road right now down in Charleston, but took the time to be with us today. Ron, please say a few words, with, if you would. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, um, you know, one of the uh, unique and extraordinary things that uh, I'm incredibly proud of is the relationship that Compassionate Care ALS has achieved with, obviously, what is now the Healy ALS Clinic at MGH. Um, you know, my relationship goes back 25 years with Dr. Merit Chikovitz. And what's really extraordinary is I've had, we have had the opportunity to work with uh, Dr. Babu for many years. Uh, it's a very special relationship. It's not often I get to interface with uh, physicians like Dr. Babu. Um, the relationship is such uh, when we have families in common, obviously, I am able to reach out to her if I see a question of inquiry or if the family has a need. Uh, she is able to reach out to us. Uh, our ability to work hand in hand with our families uh, is pretty extraordinary. Uh, I'm not sure how many other ALS clinics in the country have a relationship with an organization like ourselves where we truly do work as a team. And I have a huge appreciation for you, Suma, and all that you bring. And uh, I'm so grateful you're taking the time to be with us today. The house call program that we were able to create, which I think you'll talk about, is pretty unique in the world, where a nurse or a nurse practitioner goes into the home with one of our staff, and it allows uh, the clinic to have another set of eyes on the circumstance. Just another unique program that we are able to, uh, you know, work with and uh, cohesion together in order to bring quality care to the families that we're serving. So that said, um, Dr. Suma Babu, I appreciate you immensely, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so, so much for being here. Um, thank you so much for that kind of introduction. You know, it really has been a true partnership with Compassionate Care ALS over the years. And, yeah, you know, my patients, if you're on the, on the call today, you, you know that I often mention the uh, extension of care um, through Compassionate Care ALS that has become such an integral part of our care delivery uh, from the MGH ALS clinic. So thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And uh, thank you all for spending an important Sunday afternoon with me. And it's great to see uh, all of you, some familiar names and many more on the screen that I can't fully see everybody uh, today. Lots of exciting things happening in the ALS world and uh, we can get started with that. Let me share my screen and please let me know if you can actually see my screen well. James, does that look okay? Looks great, Soma, yes. Okay, and can you all hear me okay? Is the audio okay? Sometimes there is background noise. Okay, all right, great. Really all good. right, so 
you know, today I'm going to touch upon two important topics. One is the most exciting news we've heard this week is the FDA approval of Tofersen or Calcity um, for SOD1 positive ALS. We'll talk, and I'm going to show you some of the research trial data and what led to the approval and what are the next steps. And I'm going to talk about really how the, uh, the care concept for ALS patients is evolving and we're using technology, we're using partnerships beyond academia with one, uh, the ALS house call program that Ron alluded to and how they can be a, a, you know, a, a successful model um, to provide the best possible care um, you know, beyond clinic doors and clinic rooms. So without much ado, let me move to the next slide. This group probably needs no introduction to ALS. And the important takeaway from this slide is that ALS can impact anybody. It can impact any adult at any age, and in very rare cases, even some adolescents, and ALS can impact people worldwide. Currently, there are about 30,000 people living with ALS in the United States, and there are many more outside of US. The exact numbers are not known because we only have data from some countries where data is collected, um, but there could be, the current estimate is about 400,000 people across the world, but the true numbers could be much larger than that. It still falls under the realm of a rare disease because it's not as common as hypertension or diabetes, but you know, regardless of numbers, it's an important disease that we need to tackle and we really need to find effective therapies uh, to change the landscape from what is being currently called as a terminal illness to something that could potentially be livable. Um, you know, my favorite analogy to say is, is about diabetes. You know, type one diabetes in the early 19th century used to be a uniformly fatal disease. Anybody who got type one diabetes would die. And it's only until, uh, and that was true until the discovery of insulin, right? And once insulin was hit the market, it changed uh, the landscape of type 1 diabetes completely. And today, diabetes is a livable disease. So I hope that one day, even ALS would become a livable disease, just like type 1 diabetes, and we'll have a lot of very effective therapies. So currently, um, you know, if you look at the epidemiology of ALS in the US, the median onset is around 55 years, but I have treated patients who have been in their early 20s, have also diagnosed people in their late 80s. Um, so essentially it covers a wide gamut of age and about 90% of cases are sporadic ALS. We don't know what is the underlying trigger point or genetic underpinning yet, but about 10% uh, are related to genes that have been discovered. And we know that this is a, a gene cause, uh, causation relationship um, to their ALS. So as of, as of today, or as of yesterday, um, there, um, you know, as of a week prior, we had three disease modifying treatments, our standard of care medications, Riluzol, Radicava, or Adaravone, and Rolivrio. And Riluzol basically is known to show, uh, show a survival benefit and you know, compared to the original studies in the 1990s, we now know that the survival benefit is much longer than the original projected three-month survival benefit. And the key is to initiate early, and the key is to remain on riluzol long-term. There's even one study that has shown that if people take riluzol for more than 90% of their disease duration, their dis survival could be uh, prolonged by riluzol alone um, to 45 plus months compared to people who are taking riluzol for you know, less than 90% or so where the disease survival um, could be under 24 months. So, um, but again, this is all based off of group level statistics and studies. Every person may react differently, respond differently to riluzol, but the key is to start early and continue um, long-term if uh, safely tolerated. Radicava, on the other hand, showed a benefit uh, with slowing of disease progression to the effect of 33% compared to placebo in some of the Japanese um, clinical trials. And it, uh, the data from the Japanese clinical trials led to the approval in the US. And the first Radicava formulation was an IV formulation that was approved in 2017. And it's just in the past year that uh, an oral version of Radicava was approved. 
Rilivrio also is an oral medication that was also just approved in the past year. So we're really at this exciting time where more and more therapies are um, becoming approved for ALS. New Dexta, on the other hand, is uh, FDA approved primarily for uh, the symptom management of something called a pseudobulbar affect, or it is an emotional lability symptom. And it's not specific just for ALS alone. There are many neurological conditions where pseudobulbar affect can happen. Uh, but there's also one trial that showed that in addition to controlling the bulbar sim, uh, in addition to controlling the pseudobulbar affect, new dexta could have benefit with bulbar symptoms uh, in terms of speech swallowing as well as uh, excessive drooling. And so, in order for um, uh, new dexta to become FDA approved as a disease modifying medication, the US FDA requires two positive clinical trials, and we have one positive clinical trial today. So just um, this past week, uh, a few days ago, there's a fourth medication that was approved by the FDA. And this is Tofersen. And the new name for Tofersen, which I learned recently, is pronounced as Kosari. And Kosari is an intrathecal gene-targeted therapy meant for people, for a subset of people with ALS who are affected by a genetic mutation called as SOD1 mutation. And this is not for all forms of ALS. This is sort of a lock and key mechanism. If you have the genetic marker, this drug will work. If you don't have the genetic marker, this will not be the right therapy um, for, um, for, for a patient with ALS. And so I'm going to spend some time talking about uh, what led to the approval, what data do we know, and uh, you know what class of uh, medication Tofersen belongs to, and how that could potentially be a game changer for all forms of ALS. So um, Tofersen or Kosati is an antisense oligonucleotide, or ASO in short. ASOs are this class of drugs that are considered as gene targeted because they go after um, you know, the upstream target you know, when we look at the, um, the genetic blueprint of DNA and then the RNA and then a protein is formed. So it goes right to the level of that toxic mRNA that's the root cause of um, this particular condition, that is SOD1 ALS, where uh, there is a uh, malfunction of that gene where there's too much of an, an abnormal protein that is produced that becomes too toxic for the motor neurons and that triggers the disease. So that protein is called SOD1 protein. So Tofersen, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is a lock and key mechanism. So it's a synthetic, um, you know, um, polymer that actually would bind to that um, toxic mRNA and it binds only to the toxic form of the mRNA and then it allows for all these toxic mRNA to be degraded so that it blocks the formation of that abnormal protein SOD1 uh, and it rescues the motor neurons. So that's how that works. We know and the reason why I say that this could potentially be a game changer for uh, all forms of ALS, not Tofersen, but this class of drugs, antisense oligonucleotide, is because we know in um, majority, uh, almost all cases of ALS, other than SOD1 and other than another genetic form called as FUS or uh, FUS mutation, there is an abnormal protein called TDP43 that accumulates in motor neurons. So if we can find uh, an antisense oligonucleotide or, uh, or something similar to that that would target TDP43 aggregation, then that could potentially rescue motor neurons and modify the disease. So this is administered via lumbar punctures or spinal taps, and that's the that's, so it's intrathecal administration, and that's the only way it can actually get to the brain tissue or the spinal cord tissue where the motor neurons are, and uh, do what it's supposed to do in order to block the production of that abnormal protein. And this is something that needs to be administered not as a one-time uh, administration, but uh, patients who receive Jefferson will will receive this on a monthly basis indefinitely. And, um, and we have several of those patients uh, who have participated in the Tofersen clinical trials at MGH. So I'm gonna show you some data from the clinical trial uh, results that actually led to the approval of Tofersen. So Tofersen's approval is primarily based off of a, a biomarker called neurofilament light chain. Neurofilament light or NFL is a biomarker of um, nerve damage. 
And it's not specific for ALS, but if you in ALS, we know that there's ongoing nerve damage and anytime the nerves are damaged within the brain, the spinal cord, this protein leaks into the spinal fluid, it leaks into the blood, and that can be measured with well-validated uh, well assays. And that's what they measured in this to show that um, uh, to show that this drug actually works in slowing down the damage that's being that's occurring at the level of um, the nerves. So, typically for ALS patients, this NFL remains at very high levels once they develop the disease, and it remains high throughout the illness course. So, if there's any therapy that actually reduces the neurofilament light levels to a significant level, then that actually could be interpreted as um, re reduction in neurodegeneration, reduction in those nerve damage that's being uh, uh, that's ongoing uh, because of the, the therapy or intervention. Um, and in this case, uh, as you can see on this slide, this is a paper that was published in New England Journal of Medicine last year. And um, uh, among uh, all the various authors, um, you know, Dr. Sukovich and I have had the honor of being co-authors on this um, paper as well as you can see. And um, so the blue line indicates people who um, received placebo in the clinical trial. And the red line indicates people who actually received um, the, the actual tofersin in the placebo control portion. The dotted black, black line right in the middle is a time point where all participants in the uh, trial rolled over from a placebo control portion into an open label extension which means that that's a time point where regardless of whether one got placebo or the real drug, everybody started getting the real drug uh, and uh, in the open label extension. And that open label extension is still ongoing. And this study started back in 2016 um, and it is still ongoing right now. The open, label extent, um, the, uh, the open label extension part of the trial is still ongoing. And as you can see here, uh, by week 28, there was a remarkable reduction about a 55% reduction in the neurofilament levels in the um, in the treated group, in the red line group. On the other hand, placebo group actually continued to show um, uh, you know, persistently high levels of neurofilament. If any, some people actually had an increase in neurofilament levels as well. But once they hit the 28 week mark and even the blue line folks who started receiving the real drug, after that point, their neurofilament levels also reduced over the next several um, weeks to months. And so this, this is the first study in ALS that has actually shown that there is a significant reduction in neurofilament with intervention, with therapy. And so it's very, very exciting. And um, then when we look at the clinical markers, what um, was submitted for FDA approval was the double blind or randomized control portion. What we learned from the study is that, uh, you know, the biomarker changes happen first and they happen even before the 28 week mark, as I showed you in the neurofilament um, uh, studies. Um, but the clinical outcomes, the clinical benefit did not show up until later. So this drug actually takes a little while to kick in. And so the key is to uh, start um, therapy as soon as possible. And so in many cases, the clinical benefit did not appear until way after that dotted black line, as you can see the 28 week mark and the clear separation between the red line and the blue line, the separation between the early uh, two person treated group and the placebo group did not appear until week 40. And then after that, it started to slow down. So it really takes that long for some of these medications to kick in. But because the signal was not very clear at the 28 week mark, FDA um, did not approve this based off of the clinical measures it, uh, and only gave accelerated approval status based off of the biomarker, uh, biomarker changes. I'll talk a little bit about what that means in terms of uh, the two approval status levels in, in, the fu in future slides as well. So what you're seeing here is the ALS FRSR score, which is the functional rating scale that talks about how uh, an individual's function changes in various different domains and function, gait function, speech swallowing functions and breathing scores over time. And uh, overall, the blue line placebo treated group uh, did worse right from the get go in terms of trends compared to the early treated group but the clear difference between the uh, groups started to emerge uh, after the double blind portion in the open label extension, but favorable uh, in, uh, in a favorable trends uh, in terms of um, 
folks who received early treatment with tofersin. Similarly, when you look at um, the uh, muscle strength testing using handheld dynamometry, uh, same thing here as well. So at the 28 week mark, uh, the separation between the groups were was just starting to emerge, but it was not very clear at that point in time. When you follow, when we followed these patients beyond the 28 week mark, you see a clear separation and stabilization of muscle strength around that 40 weeks. And beyond that 40 weeks, as you can see, it's almost a flat line in, in muscle strength at that point in time. So very, very exciting. On the other hand, the blue line continues to decline uh, through the week 40, but you have to keep in mind that everybody um, who is in the blue line group, the placebo group, received the real drug at uh, week 28, so they lag behind some more, and then their effects started to emerge, as you see at that week 52. So this is with the muscle strength testing. So overall, those are the uh, two, uh, you know, there are several other clinical markers that's all in the published uh, uh, paper as well. I'm happy to share if anybody would like to read that. Um, but overall, all the clinical markers were favorable towards tofersin. So, um, and in terms of the safety profile of Kelsari or tofersin, uh, most of the side effects were mild and related to lumbar puncture or spinal tap. Um, in terms of uh, you know people feeling having a little bit of back soreness for a couple of days after the lumbar puncture, having some headaches or muscle aches. And many people had uh, abnormalities on their spinal fluid laboratory testing, but they didn't have any clinical symptoms related to that. Uh, but there were a few patients, it's a handful of patient, uh, participants in the trial that experienced some serious adverse events in the trial. And some of them are related to uh, inflammatory responses that their bodies generated against uh, Kosati or Tofersin in terms of either chemical meningitis or inflammation of the nerve roots or radiculitis or inflammation of spinal cord or transverse myelitis. Um, and there were, uh, there were a few participants who developed increased pressure in the spinal fluid. We don't fully understand what the reason is for this, whether it is related to an inflammatory pathology or it is related to a non-inflammatory mechanism that is <clears throat> underlying this, but this has been seen even with other antisense albumiglutide um, uh, therapies, uh, for example, Spinraza um, in SMA, which is another motor neuron disease. So these folks developed increased spinal fluid pressure, and that spinal fluid pressure was kind of pushing on the optic disc at the back of the eye, causing some blurry vision, or, and that's called as papilledema. And, um, you know, some of these uh, participants who developed this um, continued successfully in the trial on the medication with additional medications to lower the spinal fluid pressures, while others had to come off of uh, tofersin in order to um, reduce those pressures. So it's a mixed response um, there. So, you know, all said, um, Kalsari is approved and it's here, it's really exciting. And as an ALS neurologist and as a clinical trialist, you know, I have seen some of our SOD1 ALS um, participants respond really, really well to, to person. So I'm particularly very, very excited about this approval. Uh, in, men, in some cases, we've also seen complete halting of disease progression, um, which, which is very, very rare to, for us to see in, in ALS. And so earlier I alluded to the fact that FDA gave Tofersin or Kalsadi an ex accelerated approval status and not a full approval status. So accelerated approval status is based off of biomarker changes only. That's a neurofilament uh, light chain changes at that week 28 mark. Um, but currently um, it is approved. So which potentially mean that it could uh, be a prescription that you could get from your ALS neurologist and you could get that at your local ALS clinics. Um, and in the meantime, um, Biogen, the company that manufactures Kulsadi or Tofersen, will need to continue to collect data and submit to the FDA. And over the next few years, if the data supports clinical benefit, uh, then that would be converted from an accelerated approval to a full approval status. And what the data that FDA is particularly looking for in order to consider full approval is um, something called as the ATLAS trial. At, this is also a very, very exciting study. Um, ATLAS trial is uh, primarily for um, individuals who carry this abnormal genetic mutation, the SOD1 mutation, but they don't have ALS at the time. So they are pre-symptomatic 
but there are some changes that um, suggest that they may be at risk of starting to convert to develop ALS. And at that point, if we intervene and if we give to a person, the, the hypothesis is that we could actually change the disease trajectory remarkably. So this is the trial that FDA is looking at as a confirmatory trial um, in terms of the, the clinical effectiveness of Tofersen. And the data from that trial will support full approval down the road. This trial is ongoing right now, and it may take a few years um, before the trial is completed, because, uh, partly because SOD1 is a very rare genetic mutation. It accounts for only about 2 to 5% of all uh, ALS cases. And um, so it takes um, uh, you know, a few years to accrue recruitment into a trial like that. And so in terms of the actual dosing regimen for Colsati, um, we start with biweekly loading period. This is sort of a paradigm that um, uh, may be similar to what uh, you, uh, some of you may be familiar with the oncology or cancer studies where a cancer uh, chemotherapy started with a loading period and then you continue on into a maintenance period. So we really want to kind of uh, give, um, you know, suppress that initial crop of that uh, toxic mRNA as much as possible, really clamp it down, and then we prevent future crops of mRNA from becoming problematic with maintenance doses. So that initial loading period is biweekly for three weeks, so in the first month, and after that, it's monthly maintenance dosing that continues on indefinitely. And, uh, you know, in the open label extension trial at MGH, we have um, and, you know, a few participants who have been in this study and they, and they come back every month for their dosings and they've been doing this for years now. Um, so, you know, from a practicality standpoint, you know, this, we know that this is doable. Uh, we just have to iron out the logistics of um, the operations and where would patients go, what would be the nearest site, all of those things now. So depending on where you go to receive your Colsati treatment, if you carry the SOD1 mutation, there may be different institutions that may have slightly different ways of monitoring or uh, doing safety labs. And that is according to the institution's guidelines for uh, looking at safety of the lumbar puncture itself or looking at safety of um, uh, you know, spinal fluid safety labs um, as such. The label, the FDA label for Tofersen or Colsari doesn't actually specify any of these. At MGH, I can tell you that um, you know, lumbar punctures are considered it's a very safe procedure, but there are some considerations that we have to take in terms of making sure that people are not at risk for bleeding um, because it's, uh, you know, when you insert a needle in, your, in the lower back, it doesn't go into the spinal cord, but it goes into the spinal canal, and that could potentially, if there's a tiny little bleeding spot that could potentially become uh, quite big too soon if there are not say if, if we don't take enough safety precautions uh, because it's not compressible like other places where if you bleed you, you put pressure on it and, you, and the bleeding stops you can't do that uh, for lumbar puncture say. So we check for a coagulation lab test to make sure that the blood is not too thin people are not taking antiplatelets or anticoagulants and would put them at that um, uh, bleeding risk. And then we also check for spinal fluid itself to keep an eye on the protein count and white count, things like that, because in the trial, we have seen that several participants experience varying levels of increase without actually causing any symptoms. But because of the handful of patients who have developed meningitis and other uh, uh, CNS inflammatory conditions, this is something this would be a conservative approach to keep an eye on um, and, and act upon it um, at the earliest if somebody were to develop some side effects like that. And then also the post-dosing observation period could vary from site to site. You know, some sites may have more conservative observation periods after the lumbar punctures that you have to wait for a certain number of time on a time, maybe an hour or more than that. And other uh, sites um, uh, may have guidelines that may allow them to actually be discharged earlier than that. And it also depends from on a, uh, on a patient to patient basis too. Maybe there are some patients who may need a little bit longer rest period after the lumbar puncture compared to other patients. Most of the lumbar punctures and the dosing that we do here at MGH for Tofersen are all done at the bedside. So it would either uh, be one of us as providers, nurse practitioners or ALS neurologists would be doing the procedures with 
a generous amount of um, uh, local anesthesia. And, um, and in some institutions, they may actually require interventional radiology or anesthesiology um, experts to actually do this procedure under fluoroscopic guidance or ultrasound guidance. So it really varies from institution to institution. So you should definitely talk to your doctors about uh, what um, the approach would be for you. So you may be wondering, so if, I, if you're a patient who carries SOD1 mutation and you have ALS, what, what are the next steps? How do you get access to Kosari or Tofersen? So I've, I've broken this down into two different categories. One is, you know, what is it that uh, you should do and you'll be involved in, in terms of um, expediting that access to the drug? And what is it that has to happen on the back end that is sort of beyond your control, my control, uh, and you know, uh, how soon will that happen? So in terms of um, the first category, in terms of what uh, patients um, uh, like yourself or providers like me could do, uh, the first step is to have a discussion with your provider in terms of whether you qualify for to person or study. That's a very first step. Uh, and this a discussion could be initiated by your provider or it could be you that's initiating the discussion with your provider. And in order to qualify for this, the very first step is that you should have genetic testing done. And uh, in our clinics, we are encouraging almost universal genetic testing for all patients with confirmed diagnosis of ALS, just because we have effective therapies and there are also clinical trials for various different genetic subtypes. So, you know, definitely talk to a neurologist about getting genetic testing done if you haven't done that already. And even the gene, uh, genetic testing panels are sort of evolving over time. And it's not one fixed thing that if you had testing done 10 years ago, it's still valid because there are newer genes that have been discovered. There are newer um, uh, variants and variant classifications that are being done as well. So it's worth having the discussion to say, uh, you know, should I get retested if you've had that done before? And there are a few panels that are actually completely free of cost. It's sponsored uh, by some of uh, the um, uh, companies that are, uh, are either um, running clinical trials for certain subtypes of ALS patients who have genetic markers or, um, uh, uh, or um, uh, like bio, you know, Biogen that has an approved therapy. So once that first step is completed, the next step is to fill out a start form. So this is a form that you will fill out along with your ALS neurologist. There are a couple of, uh, I know I encourage you to read the form um, well, the couple of places where you would sign uh, on the start form and a couple of places where your neurologist would need to sign. And once this is done, then this form goes to Biogen. And that sort of sets the ball rolling for the next steps to happen. At the same time, um, there's also insurance prior authorization paperwork that needs to go to in your insurance. So there's one form that goes to Biogen and then there are a couple of different documents that need to go to your insurance. And so we don't really know at this point in time, this is all evolving fast and furious since the approval last week. So we don't know what each insurance carrier is going to require, but we are assuming that to begin with, they would at least need to see your genetic test results, the most recent clinical progress notes, uh, maybe perhaps a letter of medical necessity to say that you would be a good candidate and you could benefit from the person. All of that should be sent to your insurance. So when you fill out these forms, please make sure that you have the correct um, you know, insurance uh, information, um, fax numbers, all of that on the forms. Make sure that your team knows uh, where to contact you, the right uh, phone number um, for, um, for folks to reach you um, uh, in terms of the next steps as well. So once Biogen receives the start form, you will be assigned uh, to a Kulsadi lead case manager. They call this LCMs. And these LCMs will work with you to navigate this process of insurance prior authorization as the next step. So they'll be a go-to to find out where things stand with insurance prior authorization. And then depending on how long it takes for the insurance prior, prior authorization to be approved, um, I, I, I suspect based off of our experiences with Radicava and Relivrio that this is not going to be an overnight thing. There will be some growing pains in the first few months, but things will start to iron out, um, you know, once everybody's familiar and there are some uh, processes and workflows in place that, um, that uh, everybody understands and we know what to do. Um, but until then, there may be uh, some hiccups along the way. So the best thing is to just work with your clinical neurologist um, a team, as well as to work with the Biogen's LCM uh, to make sure that uh, you know, uh, we all work together as a team to get 
to expedite the insurance prior authorization. So once it's approved, you'll be working with your ALS clinic in terms of scheduling, making sure they have the drug access and to receive the first um, uh, dose. And then uh, if there are any uh, copies that your insurance requires you to complete, you have to complete all of those. Now, on the other hand, there are a few steps that sort of beyond um, you know, our, our control. And that, that has to do with in each insurance payer adding to a person or COSADI to their formulary. And that could take several weeks to sometimes a few months. Um, and then the second step is that each institution will also need to add this medication to their institutional formulary because this is a medication that needs to be administered on site at the clinic as opposed to taking uh, you know, a tablet or a pill at home. Um, so he, uh, each institution will have its own uh, workflow processes in order to um, uh, add this medication to their formulary. And they have to probably go through um, various different contracts with pharmacies and all of these things. So it, all of this would take a little bit of time. Um, and so that's exciting about Colsadi and the new therapy. There'll be more to come. There'll be some Niels webinars, um, as well as uh, MGH will also have some information over the next few weeks in terms of the work processes. Uh, we are working very closely with our institution in order to add Colsadi to our formulary as well. So uh, more to come on that. Now, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about actually care delivery for ALS. And you know, oftentimes um, we think about um, research, we think about uh, the evolving space in research, but you know, I wanna highlight how uh, ALS is really sort of leading the field in terms of changing the way we approach clinical care for ALS patients. And you really cannot compartmentalize clinical care and research as two separate things. I think they're all tied together. And that's what we believe in at the MGH ALS clinic. You know, we really tie clinical care into research visits. If you've been a part of research studies here, at the same time, we tie research into clinical visits if somebody's interested in participating in research. You know, for a rare disease and for also a difficult disease, a very challenging disease with so much heterogeneity, it really takes more than a handful of patients or participants to participate in research to get through and get to that finish line of seeing more effective uh, therapies. I think it takes the entire community to come together and sort of if each of us can do a, a small bit of whatever we can to participate, whether it is a biomarker study, a clinical trial, or support philanthropically or advocate, whatever we can do, I think if we come together as a community, uh, I think together we can be a much bigger force and we could get to more effective therapies. It's not gonna happen overnight, but uh, we will see that in the, in the coming years. So in terms of the multidisciplinary care itself, um, you know, if, if, you have, if you're a patient at MGH uh, you, and you've attended one of our MGH ALS clinics, it's a multidisciplinary clinic, as you know, so it sort of looks like this, right? You come in um, and you, uh, you know, at the core of the multidisciplinary model is the patient and their caregiver and a primary ALS neurologist. Um, and then there's also a primary ALS nurse practitioner and a ALS nurse. This becomes your core team to take care of um, your ALS clinical needs. And then our clinic, when you come in, you also will see, depending on what the needs are on the clinic day, you, you may see a physical therapist, you may see a speech therapist, an occupational therapist, you may see a few research team members, um, and you may see a couple of research coordinators who may be helping with some ALS outcomes, like ALS FRSR or vital capacity. All of that is done at the clinic visit. You may see a respiratory therapist or you may see the ALS nursing team beyond your ALS nurse uh, for various different reasons. And in, in some cases, a patient may see all of these people at the same visit. In some cases, a patient may see you know, you know, a few subgroups within this multidisciplinary team. So in general, you know, for people who are new to multidisciplinary clinic or care, you know, if there are new patients on this call, I would encourage you to think about you know, spending almost half a day at the ALS clinic on your clinic visit day. And, and how frequently will you see this team really depends on you know, what your needs are. At MGH, we tend to see patients as frequently as a patient needs to be seen. It could be um, as, as soon as every month. Uh, sometimes we see patients more frequently in the beginning after diagnosis because there are so, so many questions and so many things that need to be put in place. And then uh, uh, later on, that, those visit frequencies may actually change and become less frequent depending on the need. 
In other cases, patients may have a slow progressing form and we may see them every three months as needed. So you would think about this multidisciplinary clinic care as a coordinated care or, or a one-stop shop where you come in and then you see all these different team members. And um, for folks who have been at the MGH ALS clinic, you may be very familiar that during your clinic visit, we also talk about not only therapies that are approved, but also what is in the pipeline, what are the research opportunities, trial opportunities, and then um, also uh, in, in many cases, we would do laboratory testing, whether it is genetic testing or, uh, or following up your liver tests or your EKGs. And fortunately, all of that is in the same building as the ALS clinic. And is there any paperwork that needs to be completed for um, you know, insurance prior authorization for medications? All of this happens in that one afternoon or one morning that you're spending at the multidisciplinary um, clinic. Now, if you are my patient, this is what your team, your core team would look like. So, um, uh, yeah, you know, Jen Scalia is uh, our nurse practitioner that I work very closely with, and Kathy Chin is my um, nurse that we work very closely with. And we often have touch points multiple times a day uh, to talk about, uh, you know, patients that we care together as a team. And then you would, uh, there's a large group of uh, therapists and others who uh, uh, are part of your care team. Now, if you look at each of these uh, functional groups, I wanted to kind of touch upon, you know, how um, how care can actually. I was trying to put together these slides, and I was wondering about, you know, can I put all the care disciplines in, uh, onto these slides, and what would that look like? So I'm going to break it down into different disciplines. Um, this is just to show that ALS care can be very complex, and you really need a good team of. Um, uh, not only um, clinicians, but also uh, non-clinical teams to provide the best clinical care. So in addition to your core team that stays constant, you may be referred to other specialists. They're not part of the same multidisciplinary team, but they're part of the ecosystem. So you may not see them on the same day, but you may see them on a different day. And that could really vary depending on the need. You may be uh, uh, referred to a pulmonologist or to a rehab specialist, um, or to a palliative care specialist, or urology, or electrodiagnostic studies, EMG specialist, IR anesthesia, if there are any procedures like uh, feeding tube placements, things like that, or psychiatry, if there are mental health um, needs as well. So these are all the other uh, MDs or PhDs that you will be seeing as part of your care uh, at, var at varying uh, different time points in, uh, in the disease course. Now, same thing if you break it down into PT, OT, and speech therapists, and they are not uh, independently functioning um, team members. Each of them, they play such an integral role in actually coordinating your care with folks outside of the MGH ALS clinic. For example, a physical therapist, yeah, you know, there's a lot of work that happens after you've left from clinic that day, and uh, uh, you know, people will reach out to all the other team members who are part of your care team. Like a PT would reach out to your outpatient physical therapist, or in, or your home um, uh, health services team, your home PT, or reach out to an orthotist if you need a, a, a brace of some some kind, or if you're looking for wheelchair, custom wheelchair, to reach out uh, to uh, vendors that would help us with that. Uh, same thing with occupational therapists, if, you, if there are needs for, you know, low tech or high tech. And so, there, you know, we look into all of those braces that you may need. Speech therapists may coordinate your swallow tests or video swallow tests or work with your home speech therapist or um, provide you with a referral to Boston Children's where we do uh, we work with uh, their speech therapists very closely for augmented communication assistance. And then even nursing is complex. It's not, uh, you know, you may on a day-to-day -day basis, you may uh, interact with your primary clinical nurse, your ALS nurse, but on the back end, nurses spend hours and hours, um, you know, coordinating your care with various different team members, including, um, you, know, you know, the ALS house call uh, nurse and nurse practitioners, which we'll talk about in a little bit, research access nurses or research study nurses, if you're a part of a trial, or even your home health services or hospice nurses as well. So there's a lot of coordination of care that happens and we all work together really as one big team. And in addition to the, the core internal team, there may be several external teams. And this is where you know, Ron's group, Compassionate Care ALS comes into picture. And um, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, uh, not-for-profits, foundations, community resources for equipments, emotional support, insurance, paperwork-related assistance, or DME companies 
uh, working with their respiratory therapists uh, or working with nutrition companies, working with the VA system if you're a veteran, working with various different home health agencies um, or hospice palliative care agencies. So this is the same core group that still sort of interacts with this um, in a very complex ecosystem. And then next time I'm gonna show what it looks like when you put all of this together and what that core team actually works with on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is essentially the model that each ALS patient receives uh, in order for us to deliver that you know, best possible care. So it, it takes more than a village to actually provide the best possible care for ALS patients. And uh, you know, oftentimes patients will come in and leave and, uh, and it seems quite seamless in, ma in many cases, but on the back end, there is a lot of work that uh, teams are putting in to make sure that everybody gets what they, um, what they need to uh, get in terms of care. So, and what I've highlighted also on this slide is not everything that actually goes into support ALS care is actually funded through your insurance. So everything that's in pink on the slide is all supported um, through foundations and philanthropy, at least for the MGH ALS clinic services. You know, all the nursing care and uh, a whole bunch of other things are all supported primarily through um, philanthropy and, and foundations. And, you know, only um, the ones that are in blue are either supported through insurance or they have their own uh, systems in terms of uh, supporting their funding. I, I know if you talk to Ron, Ron, who's on the call, he'll tell you he spends hours trying to fundraise to make sure that every patient gets what they need to get. And it really takes so much effort um, and, uh, and support from everybody to actually provide that uh, best possible care. So in terms of other innovations, you know, this is a program that I'm very, very excited about. This is a partnership with Compassion Care ALS. Uh, this is about uh, bringing care to your home. Uh, we understand that traveling to Boston every single time for your clinical care can become burdensome over time. But if we can extend that care and add a few touch points through house call program, and that's, uh, you know, that's a program that started a few years ago and that has become so successful and, uh, and uh, it's grown um, uh, you know, just, just in the past few years um, I, uh, to several hundred families that have been touched by this house call program. And you know, this is a, it, it's genuinely a partnership between Compassion Care ALS and the MGH ALS Clinic. Dr. James Berry is the clinic director at the MGH ALS Clinic. And uh, you know, under his vision, we started uh, the house call program. Our first house call nurse practitioner, I wanna give a special shout out to Deb Skuniki, who recently retired and handed the baton over to Carl, who joined us as another nurse practitioner. Uh, and uh, Kristen Kingsley is a nurse who's been a part of this as well. And uh, you know, together as a team, um, you know, everybody works so wonderfully as a team to care for, for patients across uh, Massachusetts. And so uh, this is a slide that shows you know, the outreach of the house call program. Currently, whatever is in white are the regions where our house call nurses and nurse practitioners uh, travel. And you know, these folks are on the road every day and, uh, and uh, usually they uh, cluster and combine several different families within one particular region um, and try to deliver care um, and in combination with Compassionate Care ALS. And that's a unique part about this. Um, so um, every visit actually is combined with a representative with, uh, compa from Compassionate Care um, ALS. So, you know, how could we make the most use of this house call program? You know, there, there's, this is not uh, something that could be used in all case scenarios. So I wanted to show, you know, where we could, it could be most beneficial and where it really wouldn't be an appropriate thing to consider a house call program. So house call visits are generally for non-urgent reasons. You know, we would think about it as an additional touch point with the um, ALS multidisciplinary care team. Um, you know, and this could be particularly helpful for people who have more advanced illness, who cannot travel to Boston frequently, or for people who are having a rapid progressing disease. And uh, the house call team, the nurse or the nurse practitioner works very closely with your ALS neurologist and your primary ALS nurse practitioner. So your primary ALS neurologist and nurse practitioner know your care the best. They know what your symptoms are, what works work for you, what hasn't worked for you. And the house call team is just adding on to that and they work very closely with the primary team to make sure that we're doing the right decisions in terms of adjusting medications, revising uh, your treatment plans, things like that. So it's a shared decision that happens and we work very closely as a close-knit team uh, with the house call team as well as um, Ron's team as well. 
And the combined visits have been particularly helpful in terms of really assessing in your home env environment, what resources you need, what equipment do you need, uh, you know, are there needs for emotional support um, and, and things like that. And uh, sometimes house call um, can also be useful in terms of assessment of any changing ALS medical care needs. You know, we may have seen you in the clinic and something might have changed since. And um, before your next clinic, we'd like to have a touch point so a house call team can actually come in um, uh, and help us out there. And it could, in some cases, if we need face-to-face -face documentation for uh, any insurance approval for certain equipments and things like that, this could also be done. And if you have a nurse practitioner who's covering your zip code or area, in some cases, we could also do bedside uh, G-tube exchanges, not the initial placement, but the exchanges afterwards. But where it, it, it's not something that we should consider is as a substitution for multidisciplinary care. Yeah, you know, this is an extension of the care. You can't say, oh, you know, I can't come to Boston and I'm just gonna do house call visits. That's not the best way to provide care for patients. I think if we add it on, it really works really well. And it shouldn't be used for urgent purposes or for end of life care issues where, you know, either hospice teams or ER visits would be more appropriate. Um, it also cannot be used where there's little, uh, where there's no flexibility in terms of scheduling these house call providers visit around the time that they are actually going to be visiting your region. Um, so they, they plan this out actually several weeks or months ahead of time. Or if there are needs where you may need not just an hour visit or an hour and a half visit, but you need several hour visits, there are, uh, there are you know, prolonged duration, complex clinical care visits. So this probably wouldn't be the most appropriate, but it could add uh, to your primary multidisciplinary care at, at, at MGA. It's also not something that you should be using for like blood draws at home, things like that. So you know, tapping into this program in the most effective way would be great. And then beyond house call program, you know, we're living in this world of uh, virtual visits and remote visits. It's exciting, televisits, same thing. There are some do's and don'ts, you know, where is it most beneficial and where is it not helpful or not appropriate? So, you know, I, I really love virtual visits and televisits and we've been doing virtual visits even before the pandemic, but the numbers have just grown much, much more since the pandemic. And, you know, where a travel burden becomes an issue over time, virtual visits can really be helpful or for adjusting medications, symptom management, for reviewing test results, goals of care discussions, um, coordinating care if somebody's in the ICU and they need to make a decision about tracheostomy. So we can do a Zoom call with the ICU teams or uh, extension of uh, uh, you know, nurse practitioner or MD care for having additional touch points um, and so on, uh, or even having research talks. But where it's really sort of not optimal to use virtual visits or telehealth is again, it, you cannot, uh, it's, it's best not to use this as a substitution for in-person multidisciplinary care because best care really depends on a lot of bedside examination driven decisions. So we lose out on that if we are primarily heavily relying on virtual visits. Or again, if there are extended or prolonged duration complex clinical care visits that are required where you have to in, uh, you know, interact with multiple family members or at different multiple locations or different MDs, um, or we need to do uh, you know, history and physical before a procedure, virtual visits are, tend to be less helpful there. For out-of-state or international patients, there are licensing restrictions for physicians and nurse practitioners. Um, if they are not licensed where you're currently uh, physically, uh, present at the time of the visit, then um, uh, by law, we're not allowed to do vir virtual visits. Or for patients who are residing in nursing facilities or rehabilitation facilities, also we're not allowed to do virtual visits. Patients with dementia, patients who cannot interact through video conferencing technologies. This question comes up, I don't have an iPad computer or, or internet, can I still do virtual visits? We can do phone calls, but phone calls are not the same as video conferencing calls. So something to think about there as well. So I think we are almost out of time and I'm gonna leave you with, um, instead of going into all the research part, I'm just gonna leave you with one um, uh, contact information here to say, if any of you are interested in research and don't know where to go to find folks, uh, this is a webpage, um, MGH uh, Healy Center webpage at the top. You have this uh, link to research opportunities and then that'll bring you to a list of all the ongoing clinical trials. And then on the right side, there is a link. If you don't know where to start, who to talk to, you will click on that link. And that'll bring you to our research access nurse, Judy Carey. Um, and she uh, is wonderful. She's such a phenomenal uh, resource to have. And she'll schedule a Zoom call with you to go over a research overview talk. And if you're particularly interested in the platform trial, the Healy ALS platform trial, 
Catherine and Allison are your go-to people. They are our patient navigators, and you can take down their number. It is 833-HALT-ALS, and so they can walk you through whether or not you're uh, eligible for the platform trial. So these are some additional resources as well. And, you know, this uh, was putting together the slide, and there's no space to put all the acknowledgments. It, it takes more than a village to really support all of these efforts and programs, and I'm very, very thankful to the MGH ALS leadership, Dr. Marisakovic, James Berry, Sabrina Paganoni, and all our team members um, who uh, help, help to provide care, both clinically as well as in research realms. And, and uh, Ron, thank you so much again for the opportunity and the partnership. And um, you know, I know you're spending your Sunday afternoon with me, but don't forget to enjoy the New England Spring. I took this picture on, on my way to work one day, a few days ago. Let's um, stop there. Wow. Well, beautiful. Any questions in the last three minutes? Yeah, if you have a question, you can type it into the chat and we can, uh, that's probably the easiest way to uh, <clears throat> do this. So we do have one that says, will you send PPT to all? PPT, the PowerPoint presentation, I guess. That'll be part of the recording so people can see it, but can we make the PowerPoint available as well, Suma? Um, James, I'm happy to share, but this will, if this is recording, I'm sure it'll be a part of that too. So yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll just do the recording on that, James. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I do. Uh, Dr. Babu, question. Yes. Um, I've got a young lady with the SOD1 gene. Um, she still talks um, in a whisper. She wears a BiPAP 24/7. She didn't qualify for the trial due to a pulmonary issue some time ago. But the question that I didn't know how to answer is, if I'm able to get on the medication now, is it going to do me any good? And obviously, I said, well, that's a question for your neurologist. But she yeah. you know, has been living with ALS. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so the FDA hasn't placed any restrictions on who within the SOD1 sub subgroup would actually benefit from this. You know, We have treated, we have given access to Tofersen for patients who are more advanced in the illness as well. So we don't know whether it's, uh, it is less beneficial, not beneficial, it, is, uh, it continues to be beneficial, we don't know. But I think the best um, next step would be to really talk to the neurologist exactly as you mentioned, Ron, um, okay. to see um, if uh, there'd be a good candidate for that. Thank you, I'll let her know. Uh, we have a comment from Rena Castillo, who wants to let you know, uh, Dr. Babu, that she very much appreciates the care she receives from you and your team. Oh, mm -hmm. thank you so much, Rena. <laughs> it's very kind of yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, anything else? We do have a, another minute, and uh, we don't uh, often get uh, this group together like this, so jump in if you have something on your mm -hmm. mind. You know, I'll just jump in real quick, James. Um, yeah, Dr. Babu, huge appreciation. Just wonderful information. And uh, again, this will be recorded, so you'll be able to uh, go to our website, get back on if there's some uh, touch points that uh, you forgot about. But uh, just wonderful information, incredible PowerPoint. So Suma, huge appreciation for you, seriously. I'm glad it was helpful. Thank you for the opportunity. Always, always.